Hi, my name is Frances and I am um, a patient who received double hip implant devices in 2011. Um, I did not get better. I had a very, very hard time for the next four and a half years. Um, I didn't limp because uh, the pain that I had was bilateral. Um, but everything pretty much involving standing, which included walking, uh, was incredibly painful. And I struggled with this for four and a half years straight. It horribly affected my ability to work full time and therefore my family and our stability and everything like that. So when I learned that my Johnson & Johnson Depew Metal on Metal hip device was pulled from the market a year later, that made me uh, raise an eyebrow and um, I had my metal levels tested. My surgeon had not initially suggested that I get my blood checked for cobalt and chromium and I learned through reading and online and um, about some other failing metal and metal hips that that's something you need to have done. So I had that done. I asked that that be done and found that my levels Although were not awful, they were high enough that if I was, let's say, being poisoned by a workplace, let's say I worked in the, some sort of industry that exposed me to chromium or cobalt, um, the metals in my blood were high enough that OSHA would have come and shut down my workplace. So, um, but because I was being exposed internally in my own body um, to cobalt and chromium because they were being shed from my hip devices, my artificial hip devices, um, we really didn't know what to do with that or so I thought so um, I was seeing my doctor he was like I don't know what your problem is Pinnacle's great I don't know why you keep coming back and I'm like because I can't walk so um, I moved to a different state thinking maybe the sunshine and the heat would help I noticed I had a little less pain in the summer so I'm, I moved down here to Texas and I saw a surgeon here um, at one point I was in a wheelchair I had to use lob strands to walk, and for the most part, I just really did less and less because everything hurt, and no one could tell me why. That surgeon said, I don't know what your problem is, the x-rays look good, um, the pinnacle, which is my hip device, the pinnacle's a great hip, nobody else is having problems with it, see you later. Um, a few months after that, though, I learned that um, he was a highly paid consultant for the company that makes my hips, so that made me kind of scratch my head. Um, so ever since then I've been trying to uh, figure out what to do. I had these hips that I slowly learned were problematic for a lot of people. In fact, about 10,000 people have filed suit against Johnson & Johnson related to the Pinnacle hip and its metal Ultimate liner. Ultimate's the name for the product. And um, so I, I started paying attention and I learned that um, there were these bellwether trials that are going forward um, with little groups of plaintiffs. Basically so many people filed suit that the court said, look, you guys have to combine and it's called a multi-district litigation. So what we're going to do is make you all part of one big multi-district litigation and you'll start going to trial in little groups of five or six. So um, this is the fourth trial going on right now in October of 2017. I went to closing arguments of the third bellwether trial related to the Pinnacle Ultimate Hip. Um, it was last December, and there were two more trials before that. So um, I have wanted to find out what's happening in these cases, but uh, you pretty much can't find out unless you go. Um, I made a friend who is going and is sharing with me her notes. So I am going to court, to federal court in Dallas, whenever I can whenever I can get away and taking notes myself or I'm finding out from my friend what's happening in court. Um, there are no cameras in federal court so you just have to go with literally a notepad and paper and so um, there are transcripts but it would cost thousands of dollars to, to get maybe even tens of thousands of dollars to get the transcripts. I have seen a couple of transcripts from past trials um, so I just figured there were a lot of people like me out there right now who had these hips, once had these hips and got them taken out, were a part of this multi-district litigation uh, lawsuit against Johnson & Johnson, or maybe knew someone who had hip replacements and just never got better, or uh, had some weird you know, things happen after they got their hips. So I'm just putting this out there. Um, I did 
file suit against Johnson & Johnson in 2013, but have since learned that I pretty much don't have a case because I didn't get my hips taken out early enough, what's considered um, early revision, that's uh, or early failure is what they call it, when your hips are taken out within the first five years. Um, I was trying to see someone about revision, but everyone I saw, I found out later, was a paid consultant for the company. Maybe that's why they told me nobody else was having problems and that I shouldn't have um, revision surgery. So if there ever is a settlement, it won't pertain to me. I'm putting this out there because I, I spent 20 years as a journalist and I, I just care. I, I like a good story and I think it's wrong when, when people do bad things to other people. And I, I honestly wanted to know, was Johnson & Johnson doing bad things? Were they putting bad products on the market? Um, I'm typically pretty trusting and so I, you know, I just didn't believe it um, until I went to court and I saw the evidence for myself. So I really wish I could go every day. I live in Austin, the trial's in Dallas. To go up there and back cost me about $50 in gas and, and you know another $20 for parking and eating on the road. So, and I have a part-time job now, so I, I really can't, plus I have a family here. Um, but what I'm learning is we, these days, thanks to a loophole in the laws that govern um, how new medical devices come to market, it's called 510K, um, a lot of devices are getting to market without ever having been tested on humans in clinical trials before they're sold. Um, that's, that would be called the pre-market approval process. So here's what I learned. I went to court on a Tuesday, October 26th, uh, 2017. Oh, and I'm holding my little guinea pig. Basically, I, <laughs> I feel like we're all guinea pigs right now, except we uh, didn't consent to be guinea pigs. Uh, we didn't know we were part of a post-market trial of devices that had never been tested on humans um, in clinical trials. Johnson Johnson will be quick to say, yes, our devices were tested, but a lot of times, well, in this case, they were tested on a simulator, not in a human body. Um, that's an important fact. So um, anyway, I've covered lots of federal trials. I spent 20 years as an anchor and a reporter for a local TV station, but I didn't get better. And um, I got implanted with these hips in 2011. Um, I've already explained all that. So this case is about six people, six of the approximately 10,000 who have sued Johnson & Johnson. And I'm just gonna read from my notes that I took in court and I've typed them up. Um, they're all suing Johnson & Johnson related to their pinnacle total hip replacement device, specifically the metal liner that's between the metal ball and the metal socket that's implanted into the pelvis. The ball goes on a neck, goes down a rod that's usually implanted into a sleeve that goes down in the middle of your femur. So um, a lot of people feel like these things failed early and really have horribly hurt them. And I tend to agree because that was kind of my experience. I am doing well right now. I'm not really sure why. Could have something to do with something called the bedding in process, but I can maybe explain that later. But um, I had pretty awful four and a half years. Um, so anyway, Mark Lanier is the plaintiff's attorney. Um, on the day that I went to court, he started out saying um, to the jury, look, rule number one, when you do a study on a product, you have to actually test the product that you're selling or trying to sell. So he says the company was not testing the correct product, the actual same product that eventually was sold and put in people. Um, the FDA cleared this metal on metal hip replacement device, the Pinnacle Ultimate, for sale based upon tests in the lab, not on people. And as he talked um, to the jury the day before, he had explained to them how the testing of devices happens in either A, a lab, or B, in people. So Mr. Lanier said, even the device though that was tested in the lab and the results submitted to the FDA was not what was implanted eventually in people. So he'll go on and explain this and exactly how it differed later on in the day, but um, he compares it to two types of donuts. He brought in uh, Shipley's Donuts and Dunkin' Donuts and he said, you know, they have the same ingredients, but they're not in the same proportion. They're not the same donuts. So if you want to 
test a, a donut, you need to use the actual donut. You can't test a Shipley's donut and then say it applies to the Johnson & Johnson, I mean to the Dunkin' Donut. Um, he said in the lab there was one kind of implant, but in the plaintiffs there is a second type of implant. And he goes on to, in my opinion, prove this. Um, he asked a Dr. Pam Plower, who was a witness, um, she was on the stand somewhere else, but speaking via video feed, real-time live video feed. Her title at Johnson & Johnson was a Worldwide Vice President of Clinical Research at Depew. Now, Depew was uh, an orthopedics device company that was purchased by Johnson & Johnson in 1999. So, it's the same company. It's a subsidiary, Depew's a subsidiary of Johnson & Johnson. So, Mark Lanier asked uh, Pam Plower, they call her, well, when Johnson & Johnson refers to her, uh, the attorney for Johnson & Johnson calls her Dr. Plower, I assume because she's a PhD. Um, Lanier says to Plower, your testing is bogus, right? And of course, um, she said, if that's true, but I'm not sure it's true. Lanier says, we know not all metal on metal hips are the same, right? And she says, correct. Lanier says, because one metal on metal works decently doesn't mean another will work decently. And then Johnson & Johnson objected. Um, Lanier showed a PowerPoint presentation at this point done by a Dr. Thomas K. Faring and said that Dr. Faring had done several of these PowerPoint presentations in the year 2011. The presentation went like this. Um, it had a slide and we all saw it, the jury saw it, and the title was Metal on Metal, How Did We Get Here? A Clinical Literature Review. And this is Dr. Faring um, doing this presentation that had been presented years ago to surgeons. Um, Dr. Faring also discloses in this PowerPoint presentation that he is a Johnson & Johnson consultant. So, um, and it said at one point on the PowerPoint presentation, a post-mortem overview and Lanier says this is an autopsy on metal on metal and that's significant because metal on metal hips had not been pulled off the market yet so he's kind of pointing out look it's 2011 and one of their paid consultants is doing what he calls an, a post-mortem or an autopsy on metal on metal even when it was still being sold he goes through the PowerPoint presentation, Lanier does, the attorney for the plaintiffs, and says, uh, says an aside from this, look, this is the hip surgeons being seduced, and then he goes on to read the definition of sedu seduction, which he says to lead astray. So slide number 34 of that presentation says, not all metal on metal articulations, meaning how they move, are the same. And then he showed another slide from that presentation and it said, metal on metal, what makes it work? And then it goes on to list, is the material the same? Is it processed the same way? Does it have, have the same clearance? Meaning like how much room does it have before it sits, you know, the ball sitting in the liner, which is sitting in the socket. Um, and then the fourth thing that Dr. Faring mentioned in his presentation is surface roughness matters. It does matter. So basically it's how round is it? Is it heat treated? Do the radii match, the, the radius, the two radiuses, radii, do they match? Is the surface finished in exactly the same way? Dr. Thomas Faring talks about in that 2011 PowerPoint presentation, uh, the diameter is significant, the carbon content of a metal on metal hip device is significant, sphericity, how much of a sphere is it, how round is it, is it heat treated or not? and at what temperature. Radial mismatch, meaning you know you have a ball that's slightly too big or too small for the cup in which it sits. The alloy mixture, the, the makeup of the combination of metals, that's significant. And the surface finish, how the surface of the joint, the artificial joint replacement is, is finished. So then Lanier turns to Pam Plower who was with Johnson & Johnson, it says, can we agree that the first generation of metal on metal hips failed? The McKee Farrar and Reese Savash, which were two types of metal on metal hips sold in the 60s and 70s. And she says, 
early metal on metal failed because of manufacturing problems. And Lanier said, that was the company line. And then Pam says back, that's what the literature said. Lanier says, the company stands firm in that. That's what it told the doctors and said too, we figured out how to make them better. He's asking Pam Plower, is that what y'all did? You, you said, hey, the old metal stuff, um, that failed because of manufacturing problems and we figured out how to fix that problem. And she said, yes, improvements in manufacturing. Lanier says, and I'm not quoting, these are from my notes, you know, paraphrase, this is what I saw, so definitely you could call it hearsay, but I just want to help you guys have a clue what happened in trial. Lanier says, uh, the company said we improved manufacturing, so it was better, safer. And he's asking her this, is that right? And she says, yes, but it wasn't just us. Lanier says, y'all were second to market with these metal on metal hips the second time around. And she says, the Metasool product was available in the early 90s. Metasool was a different um, product, a different metal on metal product, hip replacement product. Lanier says, if you didn't if you didn't make them better, then you were in the same gully as before, right? The product you told the FDA about was not the product that was put in plaintiffs. And Plower resisted at first and talked about how she wasn't the one to address this question. Uh, she said, I was the head of research and clinical testing. I'm only responsible for research, not manufacturing. I believe it was the same product, she said. Lanier said, the product put in plaintiffs was a softer material, a softer metal. Pam said, Ms. Plower said, I don't know that. Lanier said, shouldn't softer metal be considered a different product? And Ms. Plower said, I don't know. I don't know the specific metallurgy. I'm not the person to ask. And then Lanier calls up evidence exhibit uh, 4950. It's a Depew, AKA Johnson & Johnson memo that goes back to 2000 and that's the year Johnson & Johnson was cleared by the FDA to sell this pinnacle metal and metal hip with metal ultimate liner. It was an action item assigned in Leeds, England where the metal liners were made. It said the company would be considering a new vendor to forge the liner to be used in these metal and metal hips. So this is a, a Depew memo. Um, he says there are several several different properties important to design and performance, aka how well is it going to work in people, performance of the liner is what they're talking about, in the metal and metal hip application. In this company document, he says, here's what was mentioned as important, and then he, he puts up the document for us to see. Microstructure, grain size, and hardness. On the document's second page, it addresses hardness. It says the hardness should be between 46 and 51, and I'm sorry, I don't know specifically. That's a measurement of the hardness of metal. Um, I wish I knew exactly what that 46 and 51, uh, how, I don't know how metal's measured in terms of hardness. And obviously I don't have the actual hip. He had it in court. But he talks about, um, so imagine if this is the cup that sits in someone's pelvis and there's a, there's a liner in it too, and we're talking about the liner, so actually imagine this is the liner. Um, on the edges of the liner, typically the metal needs to be a little bit harder because of the way the cup is positioned in a pelvis. So if these were my cups, they'd be like down here in my pelvis. And the ball fits into that. And so if you can imagine, if a person's standing up, a lot of the weight is going to be pressed against here because you're kind of a ball hanging in this socket. It's gonna be pushing. And so this, this edge part needs to be the hardest or as hard as possible. So um, that's because of something called a, called edge loading, which is something that all, all hips do. We tend to put more weight or pressure on the edge of the socket liner. So overall, the hardness of the hip replacement device metal liner needs to be between 46 and 51. The center of the liner, the domed part, needs to be between 46 and 48. The edges need to be harder a hardness of 49 to 51, that's the acceptable range. And that's harder than the center because of that edge loading, meaning the edge of the liner 
will have to be, bear a bit more weight and be a little bit stronger. So basically this memo, this Depew memo says they wanted it harder on the edges or the rim where there's extra rubbing and more force. So Lanier says to Pam Plower, who works for the company, that's the way they were being made, right? These were the desirable results, these specifications, right? She says yes, and Lanier says, that's what you showed the FDA, but then you found someone who could make it cheaper, and eventually he goes on to show they made it softer. So then he showed Defendant's Exhibit 1715. It shows that in 2003, so three years later, in May, there was a change in the product, and he reminds Ms. Plower that she was in charge of Johnson & Johnson testing at the time. He looks and tells the jury that the hardness was changed twice. The hardness of the Pinnacle Ultimate Liner was changed twice, once in 2003 and once in 2006. And he says, here we have a new raw material authorization approval. This is the evidence he's showing to the jury, and I saw it myself. He says, if we look at the hardness, now the forging delivers a hardness of 44 to 47. Before it had been, it had been 46 to 51. So now the standards being lower, the metal can be a little bit softer. Um, no longer 46 to 51, slide it down a bit. Now it can be 44 to 47. So they significantly dropped the level of hardness of the metal they were using. As of 2003, the metal became a bit softer. Ms. Plower says, this is a specification for the product. I know nothing about this area. Then Lanier calls up evidence exhibit uh, 4950. Lanier says, the desirable results are within this range and Johnson & Johnson told the vendor they'll take less than desirable results. He pulled up um, plaintiff's exhibit 6348 it was dated January 2007 when these hips with already less than desirable results and, and a softer metal between 44 and 47 instead of a hardness between 46 and 51 as the spec said it should be seven years earlier this exhibit 6348 shows that they're looking for a new vendor in early early 2007 Looking at how hard the metal will be from this vendor, this shows a range of hardness delivered is 39 to 47. So again, it can be even softer now in, in January of 2007. This exhibit was a drawing where they had taken samples of the hardness at each part of the metal. And in some places, the metal from this vendor was below 38. Now remember that originally in 2000, when this hip, um, and this liner first came out, the specs required that the metal hardness be between 46 and 51. And now seven years later in 2007, this hip was wind tested in some places as soft as 38. So in 2000, there were specs saying the hardness should be no lower than 46. In 2003, Johnson & Johnson changed vendors and the hardness fell in some places to 44. And then in 2007, they changed vendors again and the hardness was allowed to drop to 38 in some spots on this metal and metal liner. So the metal kept getting softer, is his argument, as they looked for cheaper and cheaper vendors. Their standards kept dropping, and this is what Mark Lanier tells the jury. They wanted cheaper, so they accepted lower standards in something that their own doctor's previous presentations had said was important to performance. So the characteristics of the metal hip changed. What Johnson & Johnson was putting into plaintiffs was softer than what was, what was originally tested and sent to the FDA. Now tested, again, not in humans. <sighs> then Ms. Plower says, but I don't know how this impacted the product. And Lanier says, that's something you're supposed to know. Lanier called up Defense Exhibit 7828, which was a published study in the Bone and Joint Journal that talks about the risk factors for failure of the 36 millimeter pinnacle total hip replacement system in peer-reviewed literature, he says, where the best science is found. The report shows the failures that started happening to people um, who had this pinnacle hip seem to start making the literature about um, 
basically the people who did the study said we're noticing an unacceptably high 10-year failure rate especially if the implant was implanted from 2006 afterwards or in bilateral patients hello I'm a bilateral patient who got my hip after 2006 in fact five years later when everyone should have known they were bad so uh, Lanier says something happened in 2006 that made failure rates rise and that was right about the same time as the second change made to the hardness of the metal they made it softer and the failure rate rose he showed a graph from the bone and joint journal publication that he had you know up on the screen as evidence it showed the pre-2006 implants and their failure rate and also the post-2006 implants along with their failure rate which was much much higher so Lanier turns back to the witness Ms. Pam Plower and says the product you tested for the FDA is not the product put in people Pam says I'm not the right person to talk about this Lanier says who would be the right person to talk about this and Ms. Plower says Leanne Turner um, we'll talk about her later Lanier says you're an expert in testing and she's an expert in testing so what's the difference Ms. Plower says I don't have any oversight in lab testing I don't always review the results Lanier says Johnson & Johnson didn't do testing in humans before selling this product to patients and then he explains they failed to warn the patients even once they knew of these problems because of litigation concerns he says they attacked the doctors who told them about the problems with the metal pinnacle hip they never sent out warning letters to patients who had metal on metal pinnacles they spent 20 million in advertising directly to patients and then again this is the Duke coach coach Mike Krzyzewski um, he was featured in some of this advertising that was direct to patient advertising but they didn't spend anything to send any kind of message to their patients that there are potentially problems with this particular hip product that they were selling and maybe suggest you should start doing X Y and Z to make sure your hips are okay none of that happened although 20 million was spent on advertising directly to patients so his point is you advertise the heck out of this thing but then when you know there's a problem you don't say anything Ms. Plower says I don't know how much money we spent on direct-to-consumer marketing but it was a lot of money Lanier said y'all spent more than every other company to advertise to patients but then you didn't warn them of the problems y'all never put that out did you and I believe there were objections um, Johnson and Johnson was objecting <laughs> like pretty much everything he said and um, then they would just move on so Lanier says the company used bogus testing the company used false advertising to hide the dangers and then he brought up the term ad hominem and he talked about how it means against the person rather than against the point and he says to Miss Plower that's what your company did against Dr. Tony Nargle right and she says I disagree Lanier says I have emails with you on the email chain company emails dr. Tony Nargle blew the whistle on the ASR the ASR was another metal and metal hip um, dr. Nargle came forward and said this is a bad thing I'm finding all these problems and originally uh, the company said well those are just poorly installed hips and he said no I'm finding these problems even in properly positioned hips yeah. so um, he says I have emails with you on the email chain company emails dr. Tony Nargle blew the whistle on the ASR another metal and metal product which actually got to market because Johnson & Johnson said oh this is so much like the pinnacle we don't need to test the ASR yet later they recalled the ASR and did not recall the pinnacle so that's the background on that um, she says we recalled the ASR because of the results in the UK National Registry which is a an organization in the UK that tracks uh, the success rate of of artificial joints so Lanier called up plaintiffs exhibit 6019 which was an email from March of 2010 it was from dr. Tony Nargle this British doctor the first whistleblower to a dr. Thomas P Schmalz -Reed he's a surgeon based in, in LA 
um, orthopedic surgeon and he's a Johnson & Johnson consultant, um, meaning he's paid by the company to promote their products. He's also, we've heard about him in past, past uh, Pinnacle Bellwether trials, he is the Johnson & Johnson guy who gave a huge rah-rah cheerleader type speech um, to the national sales team of Johnson & Johnson. We'll hear a lot more about this later. Um, but Dr. Nargle writes to Dr. Schmalz-Reed and says, good meeting you last week. And he goes on to say that he um, was seeing early failure in these metal and metal hips because the cups were not implanted in optimal positions. He says, that's the way I saw it. But then in late 2008, he says, I started seeing well-positioned cups failing as well. He says, um, he met with um, somebody in Graham, two people from Johnson & Johnson, showing them the cups that had failed. He says this in his email, so we could see it up there on the screen. Depew said it was only a problem in my hospital, Dr. Nargle writes, that the cup positioning caused this. Dr. Schmalz Reed sent this actual email around to a lot of people at Depew, Johnson & Johnson, uh, David Floyd, Graham Isaacs, Paul Berman, who was the director of hip marketing at the time, and Berman had replied, this is very concerning, and also Ms. Plower was on the email chain. So Lanier then turns to Plower and says, you came to the hospital for a crisis meeting about this email. Five months later, in September of 2010, you recalled the product. Instead of acknowledging the problems, the company dismissed Dr. Nargle to his bosses at his hospital. You knew Dr. Nargle. You called him an outlier. Ms. Plower says, no, he had an unusually high revision rate. Lanier says, National Joint Registry says Dr. Nargle was just the tip of the spear. Johnson & Johnson said he was a weirdo who couldn't do surgery. And so Lanier's trying to show how any doctor who came forward and tried to say, hey, there's a problem with your product, um, that the company just turned and attacked the doctor. Ms. Plower says, we felt that he had a higher than normal revision rate. Revision is what happens when you have to take out an old hip and put in a new one. Lanier says, he blew the whistle on metal on metal and the company said it was his surgical skills, not the metal on metal. Ms. Plower said, we took his complaint seriously and tried to investigate. Lanier said, your doctors are paid consultants. Dr. Nargle had been one who traveled the world to teach surgeons how to implant these hips. Um, and he goes on to say, Dr. Irving told you in 2010 how much trouble he too was having, but you had known earlier than that because you actually paid him to collect what's called outcomes data, how well these hips are doing. Um, after they were put on the market, basically the company paid this Dr. Irving and said, collect the data and send it to us about what you're finding about how our hips are doing. And so Lanier says to Plower, y'all paid him to send you the info when there was a metal on metal problem. In 2010, he looked at 660 metal on plastic hip patients and reported a 1.2% revision rate. He reported of the 262 pinnacle metal on metal patients, there was an 11.8% revision, revision rate. These were the same doctors, the same hospital, the same hospital staffers, same cup, same ball, same stem, but a different liner. One was the plastic liner, and it had a 1.2% revision rate. The metal liner had, a 1 point, had an 11.8% revision rate. And Dr. Irving reminded you in this letter, to you, Johnson & Johnson, that the data he'd already sent to you was there and you had it because you'd paid him to send you that data. He'd already told you and he says um, in a letter in 2010 from Dr. Irving to a Berman at Johnson & Johnson, head of marketing, he says, paraphrasing here, look, you guys have been paying me to send you this data. You have an 11.8% failure rate. I believe the metal on metal disease from these metal on metal hips is as bad as the ASR. So he's saying, I believe the pinnacle is, ba is as bad as the ASR, which they had since acknowledged was bad. 
There are problems with it early after implementation and years later too. I am disappointed in Depew and disappointed by disingenuous reporting by surgeon designers. So these are, he's saying, the people who are um, designing and then promoting these products that they design. These are the people getting a cut of the money whenever one of these products is sold. And then Lanier goes on to talk about what disingenuous means. So this letter from Dr. Irving to Johnson & Johnson in 2010, that was a year before I got my hips, so it would have been great if they had responded to it. Dr. Irving goes on to say he's had to hire extra people um, to deal with all the problems his patients are having from these metal on metal pinnacle hips, that his patients are hurt and mad that he's had to work so much extra to fix all of this, and that Depew isn't doing enough, and it borders on unethical to continue to market these products. Unethical is his word. This is a, a doctor writing to, to Depew Johnson & Johnson in 2010. Lanier says the company attacked Dr. Irving saying, quote, we've done a lot of investigation and we don't believe the product is defective. So um, then the defense for Johnson & Johnson took over for a while. Um, a Ms. Renfro is representing Johnson & Johnson and I'm gonna put all that in the next video. So there you go, there was a kind of my best attempt to tell you what happened at the fourth Bellwether trial related to the Johnson & Johnson Depew Pinnacle Metal on Metal Hip with its Metal Ultimate Liner. And that's the day I went, October 26th, 2017. Hope it helps.